Our last vlog we left off in Lake Havasu in February 2017. So without further ado, let's do this. After Lake Havasu, we traveled across Arizona over to the Phoenix area where we stayed at a place called Lake Pleasant. It was a really cool place surrounded by saguaro cactuses. It was a forest of saguaro cactuses. And we stayed there because we drove from there to the Phoenix airport to pick up our friends, Tyler and Jen, who came out to visit us. You saw them recently in some of our adventures to Colorado. After we picked them up from the airport, we spent a night in the saguaro forest enjoying the huge cacti um, and all the different shapes that they came in. From the Phoenix area, we drove up to Sedona, Arizona. And we spent about two weeks there exploring because my gosh, that area is beautiful. We didn't actually stay in Sedona. We stayed outside of Sedona a bit. And one thing we realized about the area is that it has a lot of Native American history and dwellings. We toured a number of Sinagua Indian dwellings, particularly cliff dwellings. The first of which was Montezuma's Castle. That's Montezuma's Castle. It's some Indian ruins, uh, homes of the Sinagua Indians. Uh, the people that first came here thought that it was connected to the Aztecs, Montezuma, but that is completely incorrect. So Montezuma's castle is a Native American dwelling. Near Montezuma's castle, we also toured Montezuma's well, which is a spring out in the desert. This is Montezuma's well. It's a sinkhole that has collapsed and uh, about a million and a half gallons of spring water bubble up in this every single day and then flow through some caves out to the river behind us. The water is alkaline, highly carbonated, and full of arsenic. So you shouldn't drink it. People used to live in these caves here and they're partially formed by the water that is exiting. However, they told us that they're full of rattlesnakes and a whole bunch of dormant viruses. So you don't want to go in there either. But maybe they just told us that to keep us out. Another Sinago Indian area we toured was Tuzigun. This was not a cliff dwelling site. It was more of a hill that they had built a city on and it was fantastically preserved and really, really neat. They also had a great informational center there. We are atop a hill called Tuzigut. It's a Native American Pueblo. Those are yipping coyotes in the background. A 110 room Pueblo that 225 people lived in at one time. About 900 years old, really neat to look at. Some of it's been reconstructed, but a lot of this was just dug out of the soil like this. And each one of the rooms has one of these stones they would grind their flour in. The last area we toured was not in the Sedona area, but more near Flagstaff, and it was called Walnut Canyon. And this was a really, really awesome area where the Native Americans had built uh, housing underneath cliffs in the canyon and again this you had a great hiking trail you could hike through the canyon and there was a really really great informational center there as well that one was really cool because you could actually go into some of the dwellings yeah and it was really cool to just be in it. We also just enjoyed the town of Sedona itself. It's nestled in these beautiful red rock cliffs and formations and it has some really interesting shops. The vibe there is really interesting. A lot of people go there for spiritual reasons and healing regions. A lot of people believe in vortex sites that are in the area, places of energy that help healing, help with meditation and other things like that. I'm not an expert so I can't speak on it. But overall, the town has a very new age vibe exactly. and a lot of art and a lot of culture and it was a lot of fun to explore. The city, from my perspective, is probably one of the prettiest cities to overlook that we've ever been to. It's just nestled in these rocks and it's so active and outdoorsy too. There are hikes all throughout the city and all around the area in this gorgeous red rock. We did a lot of hiking in Sedona. Anywhere is good, just go for a hike. We did Bell Rock, we did Cathedral Rock, and we even went outside the city of ways to Devil's Bridge, which was pretty awesome. It's a natural bridge that you can hike to and stand on, and the views are just magnificent. 
One very interesting stop in Sedona was the Chapel of the Holy Cross, which is one of the most unique churches we have ever seen. It's built right into the Red Rock and it is an incredible structure. One day we made a jaunt across Arizona and one of the stops was Meteor Crater. This is something that I've been wanting to see since I was a kid. Anytime I saw this in a textbook or something, I just wanted to go stand on the rim of this crater. Meteor Crater is exactly that. It is a meteor that came from space and slammed into the desert of Arizona and made this giant hole. This is Meteor Crater in Arizona. This giant hole in the ground was created by a meteor impact 50,000 years ago, and this is the best preserved crater impact site in the world. A lot of the reason this is so well preserved is its location. It's out here in the desert where there's so little rain, as you can see, just vast desert behind us. Over there, those mountains are Flagstaff, and um, they built a, a visitor center here right on the, the crater rim, which is uh, kind of neat, but also kind of sad because it's sort of a natural wonder, and in the past, they thought that they could get something out of it. So there's a whole bunch of mining and such that was done at the bottom, but it's still really neat to see. We continued our adventure across Arizona to Petrified Forest slash Painted Desert National Parks. And this was really cool because this area has a ton of exposed and preserved petrified wood, which is gorgeous to look at. This petrified wood is spread across this beautiful badland type landscape that has colored sands and striations. It's just incredible. The wood is so well preserved due to the climate that it's in, but the climate was not always hot and dry. It used to be a very, very humid climate and these trees had fallen into a swamp basically back in the late Triassic period of the Mesozoic era. They got covered up by sediment, the minerals forced their way into it, and that's where you get these beautiful minerals petrified into this wood and it was a really, really neat to hike through it all. And it was one of the national parks that we found actually allows dogs on the trails, so Mocha and Bella also got to check out the sites. The area also has some extremely well-preserved petroglyphs that were really fun to see. While we were in the area, we also had some other good full-time RVer friends, Josh and Kaylee of Freedom Theory stopped by. We hung out with them for a couple days before we packed out of the area, dropped our friends back off at Phoenix and headed off to Southern California. Our first destination was Joshua Tree National Park and we did some awesome boondocking just outside of the south entrance to the park. Did you know that Joshua Tree National Park was almost called Desert Plants National Park? That's because of the diversity of plant life there where the Colorado Desert and the Mojave Desert overlap and create this very unique combination of ecosystems. These are known as teddy bear choyas. They're nasty little plants, and um, there's a couple different varieties of them. They're crazy interesting. They're also known as jumping plants because they don't have seeds. They clone themselves to reproduce. These arms, if you touch it, they have barbs on them. They'll stick to you and they break off and they stay with you. People say they jump onto you. This is kind of funny. We had to ask. Uh, what happens is there's so little water here that uh, insects in the area, and there are bees around, when people come here in the summer and they have their air conditioners running and it drips and the bees go underneath the cars to drink the water. You know, if someone's been out hiking and the car's been running, you come back and you hop in your car, there's mad bees under your car and they'll come out and sting you. And then you pull away and another car pulls up and the bees are already there, all fired up, ready to, ready to sting you. So it's just a warning for people who have allergic reactions. <laughs> Joshua Tree is also really known for its rock climbing. There are like 8,000 routes here. And we've just stopped by here down at the Hidden Valley area where they've been, they've been we've been watching them climb and it's just crazy <laughs> how many routes there are. After Joshua Tree, we headed back to the Palm Springs, Palm Desert area of California, which we'd been to before. And in one of our vlogs, there's actually some information about one of the oasis that we visited there. While we were there, one thing we checked out was a date farm. 
Yes, this area is well known for growing dates. And in the late 1800s, the crops were brought to this area from the Middle East because of a similar climate. It was brought as a USDA experiment to see if we could grow them there. And they found out that they could. We visited Shields Date Garden and learned a lot about this. They have a great video, it's called The Romance and Sex Lives of the Date, where we learned that it is incredibly meticulous to propagate and pollinate these trees, and it takes a very long time for them to mature. While we were there, we had to try one of their date shakes, and it was amazing. But really, really sweet, and I think we shared one, didn't we? Yes. You could definitely get away with sharing one. Oh, yes. The date shakes are amazing. They They're are pretty so good. good. Oh, I did just get a break. <laughs> After Palm Springs, we headed to another place that we really wanted to see, even though we knew it might not be the best. We headed to the Salton Sea in Southern California. Huh. That smells so good. If you didn't know any better, you'd think it's kind of a tropical paradise, but the reality is kind of otherwise. There are flies buzzing around. Doesn't smell very good. It smells kind of like um, an ocean, except like five times as strong. Fish and salt. Uh, the water appears like a nice blue, but it's really not. It's a dark brown. This is a very sort of strange place. The sand looks nice and white, but it's really dead barnacles and fish bones from the massive die-offs that have occurred here in this inland sea. This is really kind of a strange place. It's incredibly low. We are almost as low as Death Valley here, way below sea level, and this is, is really an accidental sea. In 1905, water from the Colorado River was diverted to this area. This was all farm fields under that water out there, and it was diverted in here via a set of canals, and those canals started to clog up, so they expanded the canals, and then the river flooded, and it breached the canals and flowed non-stop into this body of water for over a year. The river never even made it to the ocean because the water was just pouring into this sink. It's a Salton, they call it the Salton Sink because it's so low and all the water drains into it. Now there's no source of fresh water flowing into it except for runoff from fields around here and a few other small creeks. Um, and the water isn't flowing at all. It doesn't leave. It just evaporates or soaks into the soil. Because of that, so many chemicals from all the fields and stuff have all accumulated in the water and the incredibly salty rocks underneath have turned this twice as salty as the Pacific Ocean. In the 1950s, people discovered this giant accidental lake here and they started flooding in because the water was fresh and it was out in the desert and it was warm and it was really nice and a whole bunch of realtors bought tons of land and started selling it off as uh, resort communities. We're now standing in Bombay Beach, which used to be one of those resort communities. The problem was that as the sea started to absorb salt from the ground, it got really salty. Hurricanes came in and flooded the lake a handful of times and damaged all the resort communities. And then you started seeing huge die-offs of fish and stuff and no one was interested in coming to the lake anymore. So there's a whole bunch of resort community towns all the way around this lake or sea, I guess, that are just abandoned. Um, and this is Bombay Beach. People do live here, but it's kind of in the middle of nowhere now, and there's still a lot of ruins, as you can see behind me, of RVs and of times gone by when this was a beautiful tropical paradise. Well, spending some time here and seeing the Salton Sea, it's really kind of a sad place, dead and dying. Uh, but some people uh, seem to still use it. People do still go out and go swimming and go fishing. The lake has still become such a critical migratory area for birds that uh, a lot of people want to save the Salton Sea. They want to do something about the salinity levels and such because 98% of all other wetlands in California where the birds used to use for migrating have been destroyed. So this has become a huge migrating place for birds traveling north to south and there's been lots of ideas to save the lake, but there's been no money. So most likely the Salton Sea will probably dry up until the next chapter of its history when it floods again. I don't know, it's just kind of a strange place, probably a place where man should not have uh, fiddled with. 
near the southeast corner of the Salton Sea. We also headed to another place that was on our list. It's a really, really unique place in the United States called Slab City. Slab City is the current name for what used to be a military base. The military base was abandoned and the military basically gave the property back to California. But as I understand it, the state didn't like accept the property or something and it kind of became no man's land for a long time. And for a very, very long time, people went out and just camped on the slabs where the buildings used to be in RVs and tents and things like that out in the desert. Now the area has some more permanent residents who still camp out on those same slabs and they've basically built a little city at, in this place. We camped two nights in a section called the Slab Low Loaves, which is kind of like a RV visitor section. And uh, that was pretty interesting. Okay, so this place is different. It's very artsy. There isn't really any governance of the place whatsoever. And there's a lot of trash and it really wasn't the best vibe. What made it really crazy though, is that it's right next to the Chocolate Mountain Gunnery Range and nobody mentioned this. There was a machine gun fire all day and all night and also bombs going off in the distance that were terrorizing our dogs. Combined the gunfire and the bombs and the garbage and it felt kind of to us like we're just hanging out in a war-torn country. Um, but nonetheless, it was still really interesting to see, especially the art. Yeah, one day we biked around to see all of the graffiti art there and we found a lot of it. There are a bunch of these giant cylinders out there left over from when it was a military base that people have completely graffitied. My favorite art was by street artist Christina Angelina and it was absolutely spectacular what she was able to do with spray paint. There's also some compounds that you can kind of tour through there. One of them was called East Jesus and it had just crazy art all over the place. The people there are unique but tend to be really, really warm and welcoming. We just visited East Jesus, which is another art community here in Slab City. A handful of people live here and make interesting art that you can walk through and take a look at. Most of it made out of uh, refuse or what most of us would call junk. They see as art. It was really interesting. They even have their own uh, mud wrestling pit and garden back there. <laughs> another big feature of Slab City is Salvation Mountain. So we are at Salvation Mountain, which was created by a guy named Leonard Knight. He first came to Slab City in 1984. This is actually the second mountain because the first one fell down, um, but he rebuilt it and it's made mostly of adobe mud and latex paint. And they basically just built it onto the, onto the hillside here. They also use, it looked like hay bales and um, a lot of the wood that they found around this area to construct these, these structures and, and this hill. And he really built it just to put out his message that God is love. Mr. Knight passed away in 2014, but before that he had established this as a nonprofit organization that continues the work to maintain and uh, build onto the structure and keep the, the message going. It is a quite popular tourist attraction here in Slab City. We've seen a lot of people coming in to check out Salvation Mountain and that's why we are here. We heard about it and thought uh, we should check it out and it was actually really cool. Caution, reality ahead. Hmm. Yeah, that pretty much sums it up. <laughs> Only no reality out here. Overall, our time at Slab City was interesting. interesting. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was definitely worth going there. It's unique to see uh, the last free city in the United States, as they call themselves. You can see pretty much everything there is to offer there in about a day. So if you want, we would recommend at least going for a day trip to see the art and see the culture that they've established there. After leaving Slab City, we headed over to Borrego Springs and the Anza Borrego Desert. We were hoping to see some spring flowers blooming in the desert, but we did not realize that we were basically showing up in the middle of a super bloom. The super bloom in the desert only happens every so often when they get enough rain and the right conditions for most of the flowers in the desert to bloom. And this brought, it seemed, about half the population of LA out to the area. Welcome to the Anza Borrego Desert. 
We're camping out here for a couple days up on Rock House Trail uh, in a dry lake bed surrounded by mountains. Today, we're going hiking. Okay, so we thought we were going to go hiking today, but everybody from San Diego and Los Angeles came out to go to the park. And this is absolutely nuts. I don't think we're gonna do this. We're gonna come back late, late evening maybe, if we wanna do this at all. Oh. This is insane. This is insane. Borrego Springs could not handle all the people, ran out of food in the grocery stores, ran out of fuel, except for diesel, which was good. Good thing they got diesel. And overall was completely overrun. The cell service went down, there were so many people, and because of that, we just barely got to scratch the surface of the park. Yeah, this park is huge. It's about 600,000 acres. It's the largest state park in California, and it's the second largest in the contiguous United States. Another day we did hike into the state park on the Palm Canyon Trail, and it was beautiful. Well, we're back at it. We are now here at the Anzabrigo State Park. It is 6.30 in the morning. We're actually gonna make this happen today. This is probably the most popular hike in the park. Uh, and yesterday, as you saw, we couldn't even get to it. So we're, uh, we're excited to see the end of the trail because there's supposedly an oasis there. And we did get to see blooms. We saw so many cactuses in bloom, fields of flowers. It was just gorgeous. One day we did bike out into the middle of a dry lake bed out of curiosity. Yes, that was an interesting experience. Well, this is the destination from our bike trip. An old dry lake bed. We've never been out on anything like this before. Yeah, it's really weird. We got it all to ourselves. I'd say it's a good, geez, probably well over a mile across and uh, very, very, very flat. What just happened? It was like this big, like, buzzing sound. It started getting louder and louder. And it's like, it sounds like a swarm of bees, like, heading our way from somewhere over there, but we couldn't see it. And they just came and they flew, like, right over us here. Thousands of bees, like, literally a swarm. Thousands. Thousands of these just went and it was like the scariest sound I've ever heard. I was like huddling behind Tom like what is that? How do you escape a swarm of bees if they decide that, to attack? Here there's nowhere you could go. If they decided to eat people we would have been gone. Oh my gosh. <laughs> well aside from the terrifying swarm of bees a dry lake bed can be kind of fun for like five minutes. Another interesting thing we did in the area was we visited a number of the sky art pieces, which are these magnificently giant metal sculptures that are spread throughout the desert in the region. Yeah, they're kind of placed in very off the beaten path places, so it's kind of like a scavenger hunt to find them all. Anzabrego State Park was incredible. I think we definitely want to go back and... Maybe uh, when it's not quite so busy. Yeah, see more of it. We've heard amazing things about other areas of the park, but overall, we loved it there. After Anza Borrego, we headed over to San Diego. But you're gonna have to turn into the next Mondays with the Mortons to hear about those adventures. We go to a lot of cool places, the zoo, the safari park, the USS Midway. It was a ton of fun, so you're definitely gonna wanna stick around. Hit that like button and make sure you subscribe if you haven't already. We'd love you to join us on our journey. Until next time, bye.